other difficulties, but some of these things may not have emerged now, but they may emerge later. So that's one of these things. And if it comes across as being, oh my gosh, you know, why don't I know about this? Why hasn't somebody said something about this? Maybe your child hasn't, or maybe your child hasn't yet. But I'm, I'm not here to depress you and create an atmosphere of gloom, um, because actually it's about giving you information, and some of it will be relevant, some of it won't. Because as has been said already, no two children are the same. Okay? So we're going to talk about the causes, and that's when it gets a bit technical, and it might get a bit dull, and it might get like a, an anatomy textbook, and if it goes over your head, I apologise. I'll try and do some drawings, but if people really want to know about more, they can just come and tap me on the shoulder. And honestly, even when I'm talking to undergraduates and even postgraduates about it, their eyelids go down, and uh, I know it's not necessarily going down very well. Um, and then also about treatments, but a lot of that will actually also come from Helen, okay? Um, because an awful lot of it is still about physiotherapy, orthotics, practical management. And the medicine part of it actually can be quite small. But I like to think that we work in a holistic way, we work as part of a team. So it's very much about management and the team together. We don't divide ourselves up too much. Okay, so this is a child obviously with a hemiplegia. So he's got his right hand, is postured in an odd way, and he's holding the ball with difficulty, he's got his arm against his side, his knees flexed, sort of typical posture. And I think one of the things I try to explain to parents is that cerebral palsy is a huge spectrum, and it's like having apples, pears, bananas, grapes, mangoes, whatever on the table, and actually saying, this is what cerebral palsy refers to. It's a group of disorders, and your child has one part of that. And even if you take the apple out and say this is hemiplegia, the apple then has to be actually then differentiated into different varieties of apple because actually hemiplegia is different for each child. So it's, it's trying to explain that and also demystify it and take some of the fear out of it because cerebral palsy, you know, again, it, it's got a lot of stigma attached to it. And that in itself can be a very shocking thing to, to, to use that term, but I think we should use the term because otherwise people don't quite know what hemiplegia is and how it fits in. So we have to use the language. Um, but in recent years, we've tried to actually be a bit more standardised about the language that we're using, and I'll explain that as well. So it, we're saying it's so like bowl of fruit, it's a group of disorders, cerebral palsy, and it affects these were this this definition actually was recognised by Sigmund Freud years ago. He worked out that actually children were born with motor problems after problems around birth. And it used to be called Little's disease after an orthopaedic surgeon who made, the, made this, the connection as well. So it's been known about for years, okay? So it isn't something that we've suddenly dreamed up in the last 20 years. Um, and we know that it always affects movement and posture. And it's a permanent disorder. So once you've got it, it won't go away. But it doesn't mean to say it doesn't change because it affects growing children. So the way the child presents initially will not be the same as he presents when, he, when she's 16, 25, whatever. Because children grow, and obviously their bones and muscles grow. And also, we know that there's also potential for what we call plasticity in the brain. So that when the brain's very young and developing, that even though there may be damage, you may be able to use brain cells, neurons, around the damaged area, recruit them to actually do some of the things that the damaged area as is not able to do. So that's past the principle of working on early intervention. So that's a positive thing. Um, so we're saying it's not unchanging, but it doesn't go away. And it's caused by something which damages the brain, which doesn't get worse. So it's like a scar. So it may, it'll always be there, it won't go away, but it can't get worse. Because actually, one of the things you've got to try and work out when you're making this diagnosis is, have you got the correct diagnosis? Or is it that this is something which is presenting in a slightly odd way and actually is going to get worse, a progressive disorder, which goes into a different ballpark completely. Um, and why does it happen? Well, it happens because the brain is damaged. And it's when the brain is either in utero, it's developing in utero, in the womb, or in the first couple of years of life. So this is congenital hemiplegia. 
And you can get children who acquire a hemiplegia later in life as a result of, say, a road accident, they get a brain injury, or a brain tumour, or whatever, and they're left with weakness down one side. And that's called an acquired hemiplegia. And they have subtle differences from children who are born with it. And the differences are that in a congenital hemiplegia, the upper limb tends to be affected more than the lower limb. In acquired hemiplegia, the lower limb more than the upper limb, and also the face is affected. Okay, and that's to do with a sort of neurology. But all of you will be here because I think your children have got congenital hemiplegia. I don't think, no, got acquired hemiplegia. Acquired, right, okay, so there are some. So that's, that's the difference, okay. Um, so it can happen later, and the child's brain is still developing, but the most rapid phase of growth is in utero in the first couple of years of life. Um, and we know, this is what the definition that people thought about up to about 20 years ago, or maybe less than that, it was very much focused on the motor side of things, what's wrong with children's movements. But people have appreciated more recently, and the definition has changed, to recognise that it's very often accompanied by other problems. And it's those other problems that some of you have mentioned. And in many ways, in my experience, cause problems, more difficult problems to manage for parents and children and teachers and everybody who works with them. Because the motor side of thing, things, you can work out, you can work out how to manage them. But the more subtle things like behaviour, uh, perception, how children perceive things, their learning, uh, are more difficult. And it's actually much more evolving because children are growing and changing all the time. So those areas are now much more recognised as being part of what we call the comorbidities of cerebral palsy. And most children have some difficulty. Some maybe don't appear to very much. So, We're talking, um, so epilepsy is in there, or I'll come on to that. So the effects, the motor development side of things, which is the obvious thing, which is what parents pick up. That's the immediate thing you pick up when the, when the child's learning to sit up and to crawl, is that those big movements are not happening in the way that you see other children developing. And even if it's a first child, I think most parents I've met realise there's something wrong and start asking questions. And then they go along the route of saying it to the, maybe the health visitor, their GP, and then they come in and see a paediatrician. And although you might think this is completely straightforward, it, it can, may not necessarily follow the same route. So people may say, oh, it's... And one of the things that can be confused of initially, because the arm is the... Is quite often the feet presenting feature that they're not using the arm correctly or the arm's fisted or whatever, that they think it's a birth injury, a brachial plexus palsy, which means you've had a difficult delivery and the nerves are damaged to the arm. And I have had several recently where that's been the thought, the initial thought, and then they've gone off and they've had, been seen by other doctors or had an MRI scan, and then the answer comes back and then they change route, change direction, and then come to me. So it isn't completely straightforward, and this can be what we call evolving diagnosis. And sometimes parents say something, and then they're reassured, they go away, they come back. So it can be, you know, it, doesn't, it isn't always immediately obvious, so it takes a little while to work out. But in the end, you've got what we call gross motor movements, the big movements, the sitting, the learning to walk, to stand, and then the finer movements, the control, the manipulation, which are affected. And then also, as we're saying, the, the wider areas, the communication, particularly if you've got a right-sided weakness. I'll explain about why it's the other side of the brain that's affected. But speech is mainly from the left hemisphere. So if you've got a child with right-sided weakness, you may have problems with speech and understanding. And then learning ability as well. So... This is, we mentioned the other side, the other effects and epilepsy is here. And I'll just explain those two terms, focal and generalised. Focal means that this seizures, and the seizures are abnormal bursts of electrical activity in the brain, which are bigger or more unsynchronised than they should be. And they arise out of an area of brain that may be irritated or maybe scarred. And this is what happens in cerebral palsy, it's scarred. And it's, that's where the seizure activity arises. And it's then like a sort of giant short circuit and then may actually spread across to the other side of the brain. 
And I meant to bring my brain here today, which is my model of my brain, but I've lost my brain between moving to between various offices. And I used to have this brilliant brain that was made of plastic and it was in halves and you could actually drop it on the floor and all the various pieces, the different lobes of the brain would then emerge as these pieces. And I used to do it partly to distract the children. The children sometimes used to just pick it up and just drop it. And it was really very heavy. And you know, it just, and then they spent a while putting it together. It was actually quite a good test then the cognitive ability and the hand, hand skills as well. But I've lost my brain. Anyway, um, and this also explains why you've got a scarred area that starts there and it may spread, and that's called generalised. Less often you get children who've also got epilepsy, which may arise in both hemispheres, and that means generalised. Okay. But focal seizures may present as actually one part of the, uh, the body having abnormal activity and then also impairing their conscious level. So they're not aware, they're learning may be affected because they're not paying attention, and then it may actually become generalised too. And that area of assessment is a sort of another pathway, uh, which I might mention a little bit more, but that's a sort of general principle. So if you've got a scar, it fires off this discharge, abnormal, anomaly big or unsynchronous, and then it manifests itself as abnormal neurological symptoms. And it could be movement, abnormal movements, eyes, uh, eyes rolling back, or jerking of a limb, or whatever, impaired consciousness is part of it as well. So it's a, when parents recognise these things, the thing for professionals is to actually listen to what the parent's saying and then try and also get a witness, um, either on the phone, <laughs> this is how we work now, we say to parents, video it on the phone and try and get the beginning, what happens, what the child's doing before, if you can, if you think something's coming on, and then watch, video the whole thing and then video how it finishes. And if you can bring that and show it to us, you've made a huge leap forward. Okay, so if you have got worries about, is my child doing something strange? Yes, <laughs> video it and time it and write down what the child was doing before and what happened afterwards. And did the child sleep and how long was it before they came back to normal? So those are sort of practical tips. And if you come back and you see somebody and you don't think they're really listening to you, then ask to see somebody else, okay? And if necessary, you go all the way along the path to see a paediatric neurologist, okay? So those are sort of just practical tips. Um, we're also saying that sometimes their vision is affected, and I'll try and explain this in one of the slides, that not every child, again, <coughs> but some may have visual problems, and you may suspect this, depending on what the child does. So things like, um, they may not eat food on one side of their plate, and you're thinking, what's going on there? It's because actually their vision on one, one side could be impaired. I mean, that's a very gross example, you might get more subtle um, signs suggestive of that, but say it. And actually the child needs then a detailed assessment of their vision and visual fields, okay? And it's difficult to do that sometimes when children are very small, but you must keep going with it until you've got an answer. And then sensory problems. So children, some children may actually not pay terribly much attention to the limb. So they need to be encouraged, not because they're being lazy, but because they're not aware of where it is. And that's what we call pre perception, so where things are in space. And then emotional behavioural de development, which is a biggie. And you, I think you talk about behavioural... And it is, I have to say, as you go on looking after children, going up through school years, it's quite often the number one problem that parents come back to, to me with. And then it's about how you negotiate managing the problem yourself and then how you negotiate with other services if they are needed. And I have to say, it's not an easy problem with other services. And that's from somebody who is in the service but also has tried to use the service as well. Um, right, so this is the vision bit. Right, so we've got eyes, nerves at the back of the eye, called optic nerves. They cross over the middle of the brain, which is in a place called optic chiasma, which is near the pituitary gland, and then they come back here, which is called the optic radiation. Now, if you obviously damage the back of your eye, damage the nerve, then you'll go blind in that eye. If you damage here, you actually lose these outside bits down here, so you go and lose those sides, okay, which are called temporal fields. But the bit that we're talking about in, in hemiplegia is that you may damage uh, down here, or it's actually a bit further, further forward usually, and then you lose what we call, you get a homonymous hemianopia, so it can be the, so if you get a, this is on the left, isn't it, yeah. So 
if you're left side, if you've got left-sided weakness, you'll lose your you get the, the temporal field on one side of the eye and the nasal field on one side. You won't know all that until the child's visual fields, but you may pick up that they're not there seems to be some parts that they're not actually seem to be seen. As I say, it could be food on their plate, it could be some part of their work or whatever at school. So it needs quite detailed testing. But it's about how the, the, the nerve fibres travel from the back of the eye, cross over the middle of the brain, and then come back. So, back to the definition again. So it's one side of the body, and it's due to damage on the other side of the brain. And I'll show that in a bit more detail in the pictures later. What it doesn't do, the title, the, 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 the you know, hemiplegia, it doesn't tell you what the child's really like, other than they've got difficulty with down one side of the body. And it doesn't tell you what caused the damage, and it doesn't tell you about what the child will be like in the future either. Okay, so it's just... It's a term, but it doesn't give you that much information, so there's a lot more you have to add in after that. So what we're also saying is it's a spectrum of disability from children who seem to be very mildly affected, those who seem to have got a lot of problems. Uh, so the child with cerebral palsy can be a child who's walking, talking, going to school, due to the child who's in a wheelchair, who can't speak, who needs uh, nasogastric feeding or peg feeding, or whatever, and your child will be placed along that spectrum. So, but it doesn't help. So that's what I'm saying, is that it's a term that's used, but we have to use it, but you need to break it down. Um, and no two affected children are the same, and that's already been said. So even if you say your child's got hemiplegia or got epilepsy, they can still be very different, different from each other. So these are the cyclic cerebral palsy that we you will hear about, particularly. So this is you know, your child with one side of the body affected, and it's usually the arm more than the leg in the congenital and the other way around the acquired. Quadriplegia, all four limbs affected. In fact, I refer to that as a whole body cerebral palsy because usually the child's extensively affected. And the other one we see quite commonly, and this is related to preterm birth particularly, is diplegia. The legs affected more than the arms, but the arms are affected too. But this is the side that we're concentrating on today. That, don't really see totally much. You sometimes get children who've just got one, the lower limb, the leg affected, very mild. So, as I said before, it concentrates too much on the movement side of things, and it doesn't emphasise the other problems. And what we say, as a paediatrician, is you should look at the whole child. And that's what the OTs, physios, if necessary, speech and language therapists will be looking at too. So, types of cerebral palsy, you'll probably hear this as well, but the, the type we're concentrating on today is spastic, which is not a nice word, and it's never, it's all got these negative connotations, but is this is a correct term? But, anyway, you'll recognise that the muscles are tense and contracted, and that's what you will feel, not all the time, but, uh, because we'll talk about how we assess this. Um, the other type sometimes is that you feel particularly in hemis, this rigidity, dystonia, okay? We don't really see so much of that, and that's incredibly rare. And it really isn't relevant in the spectrum of, of hemiplegia anyway. So, your hemiplegia is actually the commonest type of cerebral palsy. So if that group I showed you, the children with four limbs affected, or, or diplegia, it's hemiplegia that's the commonest type, about, about a third of cases. And the causes are largely antenatal. And years ago, the great fear was that it was happening as a result of birth, birth injuries. But I think there's been a tremendous amount of work done. We know that actually, for all forms of cerebral palsy, the causes are largely antenatal. But there are some where, very clearly, it is a problem around birth, and there's evidence to support that too. So about 75% of cases antenatal, about 10% postnatal, and then there'll be the group who got very clearly defined postnatal cause, an acquired hemiplegia. And then there's a group we don't know, and they could be about 5-10%. Um, 
when I say that it's the least motor disabling, that sounds as if I'm trying to be dismissive, but I'm not. It's just saying that actually, you look at other children who may have all four limbs affected and they're in a wheelchair, and obviously that's a much greater severity. Um, we, with whichever limb is affected, generally the growth is, is affected, so the, it may be slightly smaller, slightly thinner. And that's because it's not just disuse, but actually growth is affected too. And there's lots of um, research being done on that now, that there's actually other more complicated reasons for the growth being affected. Some of it's to do with the fact that, yes, the muscles are tight, and you've got to keep stretching them. And as the child grows, the bones grow, but the muscles don't grow as much. So if every time the child grows, you've got to work hard to stretch those muscles out to keep in line with the growth of the child. So that affects growth, but it's not the only reason. Now, when do they usually get picked up? I put on there four to nine months. Parents, I mean, that's not absolute. Some parents might suspect it later, or they think about it, but guess about it, go back to it. But a lot of them will present with this difference in the use of their upper limbs in the first year of life.